next consequence we have is swelling. Okay, so swelling is going to be a natural part of this process. It's kind of inevitable, but again, our goal is to really try to keep as much swelling from forming to begin with. Again, we'll talk about this. We're not going to be able to really affect what happens in that primary injury. We need to deal with the after effects of it. So swelling is just an increase in tissue volume. We have extra fluid, extra cellular material in the tissue, which is wanting to create this um, disproportionate situation. And we know that when we have fluids and solids in a membrane, fluid is going to move from the area of um, high concentration to an area of low concentration as far as um, the solutes, okay? So if we have all this floating stuff outside of the cell, water is gonna move from inside the cell, which um, has very little of these solutes, out to try to balance, okay? But that means we're losing fluids from cells and from vessels. So we have two sources. We have the direct hemorrhage, which is the bleeding and ripping open of the cells and the fluid leaving the cells. All that happens relatively shortly. We're talking three to five minutes. It's initial, it's short. There's not much we're going to really do in that. We have probably not even seen this person or gotten them to a place that we can do anything within three to five minutes. Edema formation is what we can affect. And that is the accumulation of the fluid portion of the blood in the tissues because of this change in molarity, because of this solute concentration that we have. So we have, end up with this unbalanced fluids exchange. Normally, capillaries, right, when we think about blood flow, oxygen has to leave capillaries at the arterial end, right? Carbon dioxide enters on the venous end, and that's how things happen, and it's a very balanced cycle. We end up with this unbalanced fluid exchange, and the longer that ex exchange is out of balance, the greater the amount of fluid accumulation in the tissue is going to be, the more swelling, and the problem with that is secondary cell death, right? So the more swelling we have, the more pressure that's going to be on the vessels. They're going to clog up the system. Healthy cells aren't going to get what they need, and so they're going to start to die, which is going to feed in, and now we have more swelling and more injury, and it's going to be take longer and longer and longer to heal. Plus, it's painful. That pressure is putting pressure on those already irritated nerve endings, and so that's causing pain. And the only thing we want to get to is a point that that area is cleaned up and we can begin doing some exercises so that we can have specific adaptation to imposed demands later in our fibroblastic repair and our maturation phase. And we can't get there if they can't move their ankle because it's so swollen. So mentioned a lot of these already, the proportional. So swelling is proportional to the severity of the injury. More injury, more cell death, more swelling. Changes in vascular permeability. That's that unbalanced fluid exchange. The longer that happens, the more consequences. The amount of primary and then secondary hemorrhaging. These high pressure gradients, again, that, that permeability, that accumulation. And then the presence of chemical inflammatory mediators. The longer they're around, the more vasodilation, the slower the blood flow, the more swelling that we're going to get. So again, two things we tend to use interchangeably, but they're a little bit different, so I want to kind of specify, okay? We tend to say swelling and edema kind of using them all the time interchangeably, and they're not really. So swelling is increasing the volume of a body part as a result of fluid buildup. So again, capillary permeability increases after the injury, fluids and solids both leave, creating this unbalanced fluid exchange. The pressures because of this change, pressures from the outside versus pressures, pressures from the inside of the capillaries and the cells. We'll see a little diagram of that in a minute. And so swelling happens. Now edema starts about the same, right? Fluid buildup. We had fluid buildup here for swelling, buildup of excess fluids and proteins. We're talking interstitial spaces, and again, it results from the imbalance of pressures inside and out of the membrane. 
Okay, the little different is we tend to think about swelling more at the, micro, the macroscopic level, so the body part. Edema, we're really talking about inside the tissues, inside these interstitial, and really edema affects the lymphatic return and the venous return system. So remember the lymphatic system when we talked about it in um, med topics, right? And its role in the lymph vessels and the lymph nodes. Edema disrupts that. Okay, these channels that are created, those, those get disrupted and blocked. And so the, the lymph system can't remove the solid waste like it's supposed to. A law for you to know. Okay, we're going to have a couple laws in modalities class. There's a lot of science in modalities, so you got to be ready for it. Biology, chemistry, physics, it's all here. Starling's law. It describes the movement of fluids across a capillary membrane. And so it essentially describes how swelling is formed and swelling is removed. So what does it say? Vascular hydrostatic pressure, okay, so vessel pressure, blood vessels, capillaries, and the interstitial fluid colloidal osmotic pressure, that's a really long word, but basically just means the pressure in the interstitial tissues, so in those spaces outside of the vessels, forces the contents from the capillary out into the tissue. So the general net flow is usually from inside the vessel out into the tissue. So that osmotic pressure moves fluids from the, and then so this is interstitial. So this was the pressure in the interstitial tissues outside. The plasma osmotic pressure, that's now plasma, we're back in the bloodstream, helps move fluids from the tissues into the capillaries. So normally, on one side of the capillary, we have pressure gradient that pushes blood, pushes fluid out so that oxygen can be exchanged and nutrients can go. And then towards the venous end of the capillary, we should have that net exchange back in. So waste products can enter, fluid can come back in. So this is what that's saying, is on one side, on the cap, on the, um, arterial side of the capillary, we have a net flow out. These two different pressures work together. The hydrostatic pressure inside the vessel wants to push fluid out. The interstitial fluid colloid osmotic pressure out in the tissues tends to want to pull fluid out. Then when we get towards the venous end, the blood pressure, osmotic pressure, wants to pull the fluid in as well as the limb's hydrostatic pressure wants to push the fluid in, ideally. Now the big thing is that this limb's hydrostatic pressure can be altered by changes in positions of the limb. This is where elevation comes in, and we'll talk more about elevation in a little bit. So what does that mean? This is more of a simple diagram for that. So again, normal capillary filtration pressure. We have the hydrostatic pressure of the capillaries and that oncotic pressure, osmotic pressure of the tissues working together. And then we have the hydrostatic pressure of the tissue and the osmotic pressure, oncotic pressure of the capillaries working together. And normally this should be all nice and balanced, which is what we see over here. So more on the arterial side of things, the net flow, is for that fluid to come out. And then on the venous side of things, the net flow is for that to come in. So when things are normal, when fluid of balance is happening, proper change is happening, about two thirds of all the fluid ends up back in the circulatory system and about one third ends up in the lymph vessels, okay? The pressure difference between the ends of the capillary is what forces this in and out to happen. When we get out of balance is when we see edema. And the net flow is for more fluid to come out than go back in, which is what we see down here. So if we have a rupture in a vessel, we had injury, not only do we have hemorrhaging occurring, but we have cells that die. And these are, would be free proteins, chemical mediators, things floating in the area. Well, again, 
fluid's going to want to move from low concentration to high concentration of those solutes. So it's going to flow out. And so we have all this fluid flowing out, but only a little bit of fluid going back in. So looking back at this again, whenever you see hydrostatic pressure, that's the push. Whenever you see the oncotic or the osmotic pressure, that's the pull. So pushes and pulls on one side work together to pull out. Okay, pushes and pulls on the other side work together to push in. But this doesn't happen. When we have an injury, what we dramatically see an increase of is that tissue oncotic pressure on, on this side. And so if we get an increase on this of the tissue oncotic pressure and nothing else really changes, that means net out. And that means less in and that means swelling. So the, the TOP, the tissue oncotic pressure, increases significantly. The hydrostatic pressure, tissue hydro, maybe increases a little, but not enough to counteract that. Now, if you remember what I said, though, before, is that the limb's hydrostatic pressure can be altered based on changes in the position of the limb. So if this is significantly higher, Okay, we can change the tissue's hydrostatic pressure based on elevating the limb. And so that's one way we can start to hopefully fight this exchange. So here's just another diagram. This is from your book to kind of see. Here's normal. Fluid and nutrients come out more towards the arterial side of things. They go in more to the venous. Now, when we have edema or transudate, okay, so again, the transudate stage, when the arterioles start to dilate, we get increased capillary filtration pressure, which moves the proteins and fluids out into the tissue. So we see much more coming out and less return going in. When we get to that exudate stage, so when all those white blood cells that want to leave have finally left, right? That's what we mean by exudate, when it becomes pus. Now we get even more increased out. Okay, increased inflammation forces neutrophils and other blood cells out into the tissue, and we get really that thick edema. And the thicker that edema gets, the more fluid's gonna wanna keep coming out to thin it out. Plus, the harder it's gonna be for the lymph system and for the vessel systems to let it come back in. And so we get stuck in this really thick edema state. And when we get to that point that we have exudate, it becomes harder and harder to remove. Sometimes we call that pitting edema. Um, when that swelling has been sitting there so long, that um, edema has been sitting in that tissue so long, it becomes almost jelly-like. And you can kind of push your finger in on something and it will, um, it will kind of stay. And that's this really thick edema. And it becomes harder for the body to pump that out on its own. So what can we do about these? How can we help with swelling? We've mentioned cold already. Okay, I talked about it with the metabolic injury in the last video, secondary cell death. The primary goal of early injury management is to decrease the formation of edema. We're not trying to stop what that direct hemorrhage happened. We can't do that. But what we can do is stop more edema from, from forming by reducing secondary cell death and then help the body remove whatever swelling is present. Cold is not going to remove that swelling though. Okay, Cold has no effect on that direct hemorrhage, that first initial thing, because usually we haven't gotten cold on that fast takes us that long to get someone off the court and to start looking at it before we even put ice on it. What the cold can do is decrease that secondary metabolic injury. So it reduces edema formation. Edema is removed. So we stop forming the edema as much because we stop cells from dying. Okay? But it doesn't remove the edema. The edema gets removed by increasing venous and lymphatic return. The cold doesn't do that. The cold actually will vasoconstrict, which can actually slow some of that down. But it's so important that we don't let those other cells die, that we let that happen, because that will eventually correct itself. 
So gravity, blood circulation, compression, those are the things we use to actually remove edema, not cold. Cold is there to help stop new edema from forming because of secondary cell death. So there's multiple things you've heard of, right? Rice, rest ice compression elevation. Might have heard of price, which is protection, rest ice compression elevation. There's also rices, which is rest ice compression elevation uh, stabilization. Basically this idea that we have to protect the area, also rest, we don't want them fully resting. So we want some protection. But again, this when we talk about these things, we're talking about in that inflammatory response phase. So we're usually talking, again, 24, 48, 72 hours until the signs of inflammation start to subside. Go back to what you know and what you can see. Don't assume days. Is there redness? Is there swelling? And is that swelling new? Does it change? Or is it kind of all just stuck in there like that exudate I talked about? So redness, swelling, warmth. Pain, loss of function. Those are the things you can see. Okay, so that's when we do this. This is what we're talking about is in the acute inflammatory response phase. Not what happens two weeks down the line, a year down the line. A new one that they talk about is police. So your book has police in it, which I kind of like. Protection. So we don't want the injury to happen again, so we got to protect it. Optimal loading. This starts to get into the said principle, the specific adaptations to impose demands. We don't want complete rest. We actually want this person to be able to function. Cardiovascularly, they should be doing activity. We just want to protect the area and us guide the loading process. And again, even early on, this loading process is, is probably nothing. It's probably fully protection. But we're going to get to that point fairly quickly and a lot quicker than people think. Then we have the ice, then we have compression, then we have elevation. And all those go together. So that's the police principle. So we said the cold was there for decreasing secondary cell death. So what actually removes edema or helps also to reduce edema? Elevation. Okay, which is what we see here. Other ways we reduce edema. Voluntary muscle contraction. So again, that optimal loading idea we actually want the person to potentially be moving that body part a little bit. Because think about your venous return, right? How does blood return to the heart? It's not under pressure from the heart like arteries, right? We can't get a pulse on a vein. It's all about those series of valves that have to open and close. And those valves open and close through muscle contraction. And so voluntary muscle contraction normally returns fluid back to our heart, which would allow this swelling to enter the blood vessels and to get out. So we do things like with an ankle sprain called like ankle pumps, right? Get the calf working. Try to pump that fluid back up to the heart. That also helps with the, with the lymphatic system as well. So voluntary muscle contraction can be important. Elevation can be important, okay? So here we have a diagram, 90 degrees that the force of gravity is 100%, 45 degrees, 71%, zero degrees, zero percent, right? That makes sense. But what is also seen is that we have, again, the tissue hydrostatic pressure was affected by this. So when we get ourselves up to this 90 degree angle, we actually increase our tissue hydrostatic pressure so much because of gravity that it can help start to counteract the tissue oncotic pressure that was naturally occurring. And so we can get hopefully a little bit more muscle or uh, fluid exchange. Another thing we can do is massage. So if someone has swelling in their, in their ankle in this area, we can do what we call a milking massage, which we'll kind of learn at the end of the semester. But basically kind of use manual therapy to kind of milk that swelling back up towards the lymph vessels. And most of our lymph vessels are actually usually on the medial side of limbs, if you remember back to um, med topics. So we want to kind of push usually and guide some of that fluid. Now we don't want to push hard. We're not trying to put pressure on those injured tissues. We don't want to reactivate the acute inflammatory response phase. No recurring inflammation, right? But we can gently kind of milk some of that out. And that's especially effective when we get into later stages, when we have that um, exudate situation where that edema is just not recovering on its own. 
So we're no longer maybe in that acute inflammatory phase where um, pressure on those tissues is really going to hurt. We're in that phase that that swelling just will not leave. Okay. We can electrically induce muscle contractions, which will be our Easton. We can actually put pads and make the muscles contract to help pump that in. If they can do it voluntarily, we'd much rather do it voluntarily though. Okay. Passive range of motion. Working through range of motion, even with us as the individuals. So if we can't get them to voluntarily muscle contract, we can still move the body part. And that can create a reduction in edema. And then we have compression devices. Okay, there's three different types of compression that you need to be aware of. You have focal compression, which is putting pads directly on areas of swelling. So you guys, if you remember back to intro class, right, when you made the horseshoe and you would put the horseshoe in an ankle sprain and wrap that up, that's focal pressure because you're putting pressure directly over areas that the swelling wants to sit. Okay, you also have circumferential, which is even pressure over the entire circumference. And we use that most often in evenly body uh, shaped body parts. So that's what you learned in your funnel, right? So you funnel it up, you have equal compression kind of all around as you move up the ankle and we get from higher pressure to lower pressure so that we wanna funnel that fluid out. Sorry about that. Then you have collateral pressure, which is pressure on only two sides of the body. You guys might've seen like things like air casts, right? They have little pockets of like air or gel and they just kind of look like stirrups and you strap them on. That's uh, pressure where we just have collateral pressure on either side. Ideally, we like to really focus on focal and circumferential. Now we can do this with compression wraps, ACE wraps, and we'll talk more about that um, when we get to cold and using ACE wrap with cold, but there's other things we can do too. Um, you can ha <coughs> have like the game readies, which is a pneumatic compression device where we actually pump air or water into a sleeve to help create that pressure. Okay, and there's debate on if one is better than the other. Okay, and then we can have situations, so that can be one where we pump the same amount of fluid through the whole sleeve. You can have ones where it has different chambers, so more pressure here, little mini pressure here, less pressure here, or it can like pump. So we do pressure here, no pressure here, and then we pump here and pump that fluid up more, and then pump that fluid up more. So this is a nice little table from your book of the difference in the femoral blood flow in the vein, femoral vein. So milliliters per minute. So high numbers means high blood flow in the veins, which is what we want, right? Returning to the body. And so passive straight leg raises in the femoral vein. So again, that's the, up in the cat or up in the thigh, excuse me, that had the highest level. So passive straight leg raising where I just lift them up or they're just sitting there with gravity elevated. We have continuing passive motion machines that we'll talk about, right? Where we strap someone in and it passively moves them through. That's the passive range of motion. Anatomical versus non-anatomical. Active ankle dorsiflexion, what that does for femoral. A pneumatic sleeve, that would be like the game readies. Manual calf compression, so an ace wrap. And then passive dorsiflexion. So you can see what you can be doing to really change that blood flow and increase that blood flow. And a combination of all these, probably great. So there's lots of things to be thinking about. And again, with edema, it's super interesting that the elevation, that increase in the tissue hydrostatic pressure is important, but actually what's more important is the fact that we're not down at zero degrees that we're not hanging and gravity dependent and having to make our body, our, our veins fight against gravity all the time. That kind of the, the running joke is, you know, elevation is good, but not elevating is so bad that we would not want to risk that. And so we elevate more so to not be not elevating. It's that important.